faith. Faith is an interesting subject in so much as it presents as certainly true that which cannot be known. Okay, that's cool. In a vacuum. But the reason why I bring this up is because sometimes when I think about faith and faith-based belief systems and then people groups who believe or subscribe to faith-based belief systems, um, there are implications that come to mind and the implications are often sociological and um, political. What I mean by that is if you deconverted from religion, you likely did so also from a community who held those same beliefs. And sometimes when we do that, we realize we have just taken upon ourselves a role that is stigmatized, a behavior that has stigma attached to it. And then we start realizing the danger of it. You see, when I was a Christian and I started becoming skeptical of Christian claims after 20 years, I realized, whoa, why the pushback? You see, at first I didn't see my skepticism as anything problematic. I saw it only as something as what like theologians might see their skepticism because in order to be a theologian, you've got to ask questions and you've got to tackle them and they're hard. Now you have two types of theologians. All right, let's just categorize them really quick. The type of theologian that is brutally honest and says, there is no answer for this and therefore no reason to believe it. And then some either choose to continue to believe it or they choose to deconvert from that dogma. And then you have the other type of theologian. The other type of theologian, intellectually honest as well, will say, there's no reason to believe, like we don't have any reason to believe this. And I'll, I'll bring up a really good point here. <clears throat> Nevertheless, I put my full faith and confidence in the fact that this is still true. Like, it's the craziest thing, right? But, you, like, you understand. We all understand religion. That's how it's like. Okay. Um, so, why is this problematic? It's problematic when you're skeptical and even when you're trying to educate yourself in religion as a theologian, which anybody who ponders what the Bible says and then means, you are now, congratulations, a theologian. All right? You're going to have haters who say you're not a theologian. Scrap that, man. Psh! Everybody's a theologian when they think about what holy scriptures say and mean. You're, the degree or professional theologian that you are determines on your level of study. And then, depending on who you're talking to, your level to your ability to either make sense out of the text or to maintain faith, despite the text. <laughs> so you're going to have different, diff, uh, different opinions there. Anyways. So I thought I was being a good theologian, asking skeptical questions and, uh, you know, with a smile on my face thinking, hey, we're all about to learn something more and go deeper in our faith. And I, I realized the questions that I was asking don't actually have answers, or at least none that you, I was aware of. For those that don't know, I was a theological and uh, biblical studies student at a private Christian university along my deconversion journey. And... When I was going through these, I started involving my Christian community on, on my journey. And I realized people were very uncomfortable having the conversations to which, when you apply common sense for five seconds, you realize there is no answer to, number one, here it is. All right, here's, here's the best one. It's the, it's the leading one that Christianity must assert and get you to believe first in order to properly evangelize you. Sin. Sin. Does anybody know how, what sin is? Can anybody give a definition of sin? I'm going to give you a hint. You can't. You cannot define sin. Because let's say you give one sentence and you define sin. You've just excluded every behavior outside of that, every behavior and status, outside of that one definition, that very linear definition of your one sentence of sin, and therefore everything existing outside of that definition, therefore isn't under the influence of sin. All right, so we're kind of, we're on that slippery slope where we say, okay, well, we got to, well, we can define it further, not just in one sentence. Then you define it further. Do you know how many ways the Bible defines 
sin. I mean, there's like 20 different ways at least. Um, the problem with the theology behind sin, uh, which is called uh, hamartiology, I believe, the study of sin, hamartiology. Somebody check me on that term. I'm probably saying it wrong. Hamartiology. Um, Christianity has to get you to buy into it. You've heard this. We've all heard this. Um, hey, you're sick. Might not have known that, but you are. And um, that sickness is called sin. And um, congratulations, though, because we, we have the cure for you. And uh, the cure is called Jesus and salvation and faith. And, um, but it has to start with sin because without sin, there's no savior. Without, a, uh, without sin and without a savior, there is no Christianity. All right, so let's bring it all the way back to sin again. Nobody can define it. That is one of the biggest problems. The foundation upon which Christianity is built, you might think, is God. Um, and sure, you can say it goes hand in hand with sin, but it's simply, it's sin. It is sin. You have to suffer a loss in order for there to be a need for a savior. Otherwise, you end up with something more like deism, deism, a deity, um, rather than the Christian God. Because if it, there is no sin, there is no original sin, there is no inherited sin, there is no natural sin, there is no all these different types of sins that you can give name to, but you get the idea. Uh, then the primary cause for a personal relationship with a deity or the Christian God goes out the window. So you have to have good theology behind sin. Now, it just so happens our best theology on sin starts and ends with the following statement. We don't know what it is, how it happened, or where it came from. There you go. That's it. That's it. I've saved you uh, your entire time as a human being and theologian studying hamartiology, the study of sin. They, you, you, we're done. Class dismissed. That's it. Okay. All right. Let's go a little bit deeper then. Um, sin, you can define it one way. It's the transgression of a divine law. Okay. There's a problem there. In order to have a divine law, you have to have a divine law giver. We don't have that. In case you don't know. All right, I don't want to get hung up on the sin thing, but I'll just finish this point right here. Um, in order to have a divine law, you have to have a divine law giver. We don't have that. What we do have is a book that was written, edited, compiled, um, distributed by men who said it was inspired by a god. So we have to take a man's word for it, all right? Now listen, please, nobody, nobody please say that God wrote the Bible. You guys are smart in this group. You're not going to say that. Um, so, if there's no, if there is a claim that a divine law exists, there must be a divine law giver. That divine law giver must also have the ability um, to award punishment for the transgressions. All right. All three of those that I've named so far, we have zero evidence for. We have zero evidence for a divine law, a divine law giver, and um, actual restitution for a transgression against that law. We humans do not witness any of those three. All right, so if that's not a proper debunking of our first definition of sin, the definition first one being transgression of a divine law, then I don't know what is. <laughs> And neither do you. <laughs> so right there with our first definition of sin, Christianity and the need for a relationship with a personal deity is out the window. Gone. That's it. Gone. Now, ask yourself and ask the next Christian you meet. Maybe it might even be your buddy. You can just ask a harmless question. Hey, what is sin? And, and, and why should we care? If they don't even approach what I just said and try to address that, then you've got to be out of your mind as a Christian because you just bought into the biggest con, the con that said you've got cancer even though you didn't know it. 
and I've got the cure. And, and, you know, it's, you know, it might ring true like homeopathy, you know, like, you know, drink this water and everything will be okay. Uh, the, the water of life is Jesus Christ. And all you really got to do is say something, say you believe, you know, and depending on what church you go to, you know, dunk yourself underwater a little bit, get a little wet. It, it, and then another church, hey, you can't just say it, man. You've got to do it. You've got to have fruit of the spirit, you know, to prove you're like us. So that's the con, guys. The, the con is you have to believe it. That's it. That's the con. Now, no con is, is really good, you know, w without acquiring something from you.